at Stankiewicz's talk. I'm Lisa Collins and I'm the president of SCAS. We're really excited to have you all join us again for the event and we hope to continue spotlighting our board members with these talks. We hope that these events increase your connection to SCAS and show you the value in continuing to support SCAS and our mission to support the science and the scientists working in Southern California. For our guests, if you enjoy this talk, we'd love for you to join SCAS as a member and we do offer our student rates. We hope to see you all at future SCAS spotlights and at this spring's annual meeting, which will be held in a similar virtual format. Now I'd like to introduce our moderator, Ms. Alicia Way. Ms. Way is a graduate of the SCAS research training program, which she participated in for two years from 2012 to 2014. She worked on projects studying the environmental impact of using LED for street lamps and a project examining ALS patient specific drug relations. Both of these projects were presented at SCAS annual meetings. Ms. Way traveled with the research training program to present her work at the National American Junior Academy of Sciences meeting in Chicago, Illinois in 2014. Today, Ms. Way is a PhD student at the University of Notre Dame. She's researching and testing new technologies using light to examine cancerous tissues. This work represents a quick and non-invasive method that allows for more frequent measuring of the patient, as well as tailoring a patient-specific chemotherapy. Thank you for being here tonight and moderating Ms. Way. We're thrilled to have you join us. Uh, thank you for having me. So I just wanna say again, um, the SCAS research training program was a really important part of my high school experience. I would not be where I am right now without having gone through it. For the audience, there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Please ask your questions through there. I will be pinning questions throughout the talk and we'll ask as many of them as possible towards the end. Today, our speaker is Dr. Stankiewicz. He received his bachelor's in biological sciences from Cornell University, followed by his PhD in animal behavior, behavior from UC Davis. Afterwards, he was a Darwin postdoctoral fellow at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And before his time at Cal State Long Beach, he was a lecturer at the University of Massachusetts and also a teaching fellow at Harvard. His research now focuses on evolution, ecology, and behavior of predator-prey interactions. Today, Dr. Stankiewicz will be presenting on how anti-predatory defenses evolved in mammals. And with that, take it away. All right, well, thank you very much. I appreciate being here. Um, I'm excited to talk to everyone, everyone today. Um, so tonight I'm gonna talk to you a little, little bit about our research on the evolution of anti-predator defenses and, and coloration in mammals. We also have a, in, my, in my lab a, a broad uh, research program on urban ecology, studying coyotes and other urban car carnivores throughout Orange County. Um, but tonight we're gonna focus on defenses and stinky things, spiny things and black and white things. So just a little bit, bit of background, most of the, of the work that's out there on the evolution of anti-predator defenses and the warning colors that advertise them uh, are studied in invertebrate and frog prey species, species with avian predators. So people make models of, the, of these, uh, these small animals and use live birds to attack them. Um, and so, and we, we know a lot about um, warning coloration evolution and defensive evolution fr from these systems. However, not as much attention has been paid to more active defenses. So all of these things require the predator to actually eat and taste the animal before they actually uh, um, get that hit of, of noxiousness. Whereas more active de de defenses actually protect the animal before consumption actually occurs. And so here you see a bombardier beetle firing off um, hot acidic uh, secretions out of its abdomen um, and a spotted skunk doing a handstand and it can spray um, its noxious sprays um, uh, while doing that handstand as well. So, so these more active de defenses are actually more understudied and we want to learn more about how that they work and how um, they might be differently advertised than the more passive defenses. But tonight I'm going to talk to you about the, the evolution of defenses in general in mammals and there's a lot of different ways that mammals defend themselves morphologically. Uh, the first way are with spines. So we see that we see spines in, in echidnas, which live in Australia and New Guinea. Um, we see spines in tenrex, which are small shrew-like animals that live in Madagascar. And of course, hedgehogs that live in, in um, all over Europe and Asia and in Africa. Uh, and, and so all three of these things have the, this nice, these nice, nice short, but very sharp spines. Uh, 
Uh, we also see spines and quills and rodents. So there's two families of porcupines that bear quills. So that the, on the bottom, you see new world por porcupines and those quills actually come out really easily with they have little barbed tips. Very painful if you get them in your hand. And on the top, you see a, an, an African porcupine with its big thick quills um, being attacked by a leopard. And these, these defenses are actually quite effective. Uh, here's a video of a, of a large African porcupine being harassed by lions. Um, I don't know what happened to this animal. I like to think it got, it got away, but these, these lions are, are learning the hard way that they might not want to mess with this animal. Uh, the, the, the largest spines or quills on these porcupines are actually quite thick. They're about the size of a pencil and they're, they're black and white striped with striations on them. Uh, and there's, they're very, very, very sharp. They have a nice, um, almost like a blade-like ridge on them as well that helps them slide into, into tissue. And there's actually a report uh, that they found a, a dead leopard with a, with a quill that pierced the heart of the animal to kill it instantly. So these things mean business and they're actually quite effective. In addition to the spiny animals, we also see armored animals among mammals. Of course, the armadillos have a nice carapace of osteoderms uh, that, that's made of bone. And the pangolins, which are one of the most endangered and tra trafficked animals on the planet, uh, they have, a, have a, um, an armor of keratin scales all over their body. And these are, actually, these are also quite effective. So here's a lion, tr again, trying to, to get through this impenetrable armor of the pangolin and not being very, very uh, successful. Once they curl up in that ball, they're almost impossible to, to, to peel apart and, and kill. So you can see that, that these defenses have evolved a number of times throughout the, the, the um, class mammalia. So I've got arrows there showing where each of these things popped up in the family tree, including these, these stinky animals among the carnivores, um, the, the, the skunks and other, other stinky animals, which we'll talk about later on. So these anti predator defenses have evolved a number of different times. And one of the main questions we ask in my lab is what ecological conditions favored the evolution of specialized mor morphological defenses in the first place? So there's a clear anti-predator function to, to these traits. We want to know what actually favors them in the first place. So to take a broader step back, we can look at, at the, some very basic aspects of, of these animals' lives that might favor the evolution of these traits. So as, uh, on this, this figure, you, you can see we have uh, body size on the x-axis uh, with, small, with small mammals going up to large mammals, um, and then habitat openness from dense forests up to dry deserts. And as you go, for, as, as you evolve larger body sizes from very small rodent-like things to more rabbit-sized things, um, you, you, uh, you become easier for predators to see. And uh, so, so as you get larger, you become easier and easier to, 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 to see. And then you get even to this range where you're fairly easy to see, but past a certain point, about 10,000 grams or 10 kilograms, you actually become harder to capture for most predators. So most predators can't capture you once you pass about 10 kilograms. In fact, only 15% of mammalian carnivores and 1% of bird of prey species can eat mammals that are more than 10 kilograms in size. And if you uh, um, increase your, um, and if you move, as you move into more open habitats, you also become easier for predators to see. So you can see that there's a progression here and there, there may actually be this sweet spot where, where natural selection favors specialized defenses at intermediate body sizes in more open habitats as you become more exposed in your habitat. So we did a large study of 3,500 mammal species and it scored their defenses for, on a scale of zero to 50, um, where the larger, more robust defenses like armadillos and porcupines and skunks have the highest scores. Um, and those that, that don't have any defenses all just have soft fur are scored as a zero. And so here is the same graph just with our data on it. The black points are all um, animals that lack these morphological defenses and the colored dots are the ones that have uh, these stronger defenses. So the warmer and larger, the warmer the color, the larger the marker, the more robust the, uh, their defenses. And as you can see, the, these, these species cloud very nicely right where we would like them to. And uh, um, so what we found was that large and intermediate size insectivores that live in open habitats are more likely to have robust defenses. So it, it appears that once you adopt this lifestyle of being intermediate in body size and living in open habitats, you become very visually exposed to predators and are, are um, at, at greater risk. And so that favors these, these, more, um, these stronger defenses. So once you have these defenses, in order to build them, what do you need to give up? Because carrying or building and carrying on a coat of armor is actually really rough. It's actually, it takes a lot of energy. So we thought about, well, what might be some trade-offs for, for this type of lifestyle? 
And one of the thoughts that came to mind was that brain tissue is actually quite expensive. It's one of the two most expensive tissues in the body to build and maintain, brain tissue and gut tissue. And so we looked at how brain size might, might uh, um, be a payment for building these strong defenses. So if you look at how brain, brain size scales with body weight, obviously larger animals are gonna have larger brains. Just, just as you get larger, you're gonna have bigger parts. Um, but we want to measure relative brain size. How big is your brain relative to what it should be based on your body size? So one of the ways we do this is through a, a measure called encephalization quotient. And encephalization quo quotient um, is the actual is the is how large your brain is relative to what it should be based on your body size. And so if you if you have an EQ uh, um, of if you uh, of greater than one, it means you're above this trend line. If you have an EQ less th th than one, it means you're below the, this trend line. And um, uh, is there an issue? Okay, sorry, I'm I'm seeing ch chats here. Uh, so if if there's an EQ greater than one, it means you have a larger brain than average. If you have have a have a uh, an EQ less than one, it means your brain is smaller than you would expect based on their body size. So what, what we might say is that those that have have larger brains than expected are, are going to be smarter or more cognitively advanced than those that have smaller brains or their body size. So we looked at how does EQ relate to, to, to their defensive score. And one of my former undergraduates, Ashley Romero, who's now a PhD student at University of Arkansas, did, did, did this study while she was at Cal State Long Beach. And, and what, what we found was that indeed, as the, their defensive score increased, as they evolved more robust defenses, um, they actually lose relative brain size. And so there's two, two key explanations for, for this. The proximate level, um, species that invest more in body armor and, and sprays can't afford to, to build a larger, more expensive brain. It, 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 there's an undejected trade-off there. But also at the ultimate level, species with strong defenses can afford to be less cognitively advanced. Um, and, and because they, they don't have to be, be looking around their environment all the time for, for predators flying around or wandering around. So um, there, there's, it's, it's, not a, it's not as big of a cost for them to bear by having smaller brain sizes. We've now gone to, to, to look at these types of effects in each individual taxon uh, where we see these, these defenses evolve. Former undergraduate Colin Stensrud did his, his honors thesis on the evolution of spines in those tenrex. So you can see that there's, a, there's about four or five species of tenrex here that have nice robust spines. All the rest of the tenrex are small and furry. Um, and so we asked how, how are there are, do these, same, do these same trends apply where more exposed species uh, have stronger defenses um, and how does that affect their brain size as well? And, and indeed what Colin found what, was that um, the spiny species, that the ones that have, that have greater spine essence have, are larger in body size, uh, have, are, live in more open habitats um, and are therefore more, more exposed to, um, to their predators. And he also found the same effect with, with, with EQ. Those that had, that had spines also had lower EQs than, than those that, that lack spines. So we, this, see, we see the same trends at this, at the, at the, at the, in this one small group as we do across all the mammals. We're of course exploring these same, the same questions in other groups. So we have porcupine quill evolution. Uh, this is Mar uh, Mariana Leva, who's a current CSULB Mark fellow in my lab. She's studying the evolution of porcupine quills uh, and the coloration of the animals. Um, we've, we're, we're also doing work with echidnas. I spent my sabbatical uh, in spring of 2019 in Australia um, doing some field experiments on, on short-beaked echidnas in, in Western Australia out in dry wood, woodlands. Um, we ca captured them. It's really easy to walk up to an echidna and just scoop it up and capture it. But you need to wear these big thick gloves because their spines are really sharp. And we applied transmitters to, uh, to them so we could, we could track them over time, put some nail polish marking on their spines. Um, and these animals were, were really fun to work on. They dig in really well, exceptionally strong. Um, but um, so we were looking at their behavior in the field. But we also were studying the, them in, in, in museums as well. So studying how we're looking at how echidna spines evolved as well in, in, in greater depth. Uh, and we're just now dipping our toes into the water with armor. So Caitlin Stapson, a master's student in my lab, and she's been, been looking at um, armor evolution in armadillos where we went to the to the Smithsonian Museum and CT scanned a bunch of armadillo um, specimens. And she's now um, looking at these at these scans and measuring the thickness of their armor. And we're, we're looking at how they um, how these same types of, of, of environmental and biological factors might influence the evolution of armor in these species. 
So those are the types of things we're doing with 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 armor evolution. But now I want to transition and spend most of the rest of the, of the talk talk talking about uh, stinky things, which is one of the specialties of our lab. So um, here you can see back to this tree I showed you be before. Uh, um, noxious secretions are found amongst the carnivores. And when, when I tell you that, you normally just think of skunks, but there's actually a bunch of different species that use noxious de defenses um, uh, when faced with predators. So in this slide, we see a bunch of different species. Believe it or not, there's only one skunk in this picture. Uh, the, the animal on this top, the top left is a spotted skunk you might be, be aware of. If you're, if you're lucky, you, you may have even seen it in the wild. They, they do live in Southern California. Um, but they're very, very hard to actually see. They're, they're much more secretive than a striped skunk. None of the rest of these are actually skunks. So this animal up here is a stink badger. It's in the same family as skunks, but it lives in Southeast Asia. And uh, they can spray very well, uh, just like skunks can. They have a little white cap on the back of their head, but, but no white stripe down, down their back. Then you have a whole slew of more weaselly polecat type species that live in Africa. So you have, have these, these Zorilla here in the middle, which is kind of like the skunk of Africa, a little bit smaller than, than a skunk, but it has a black body with four white stripes that go down its back. But it sprays and directs that spray just as well as a skunk can, but evolved, it, evolved that spray completely independently of, of a striped skunk. In fact, the chemical nature of that spray is entirely different than what skunks use. We also have relatives of these guys. We have, a, we have a striped weasel down here, a marble polecat. They can do very similar things with spraying. This is a grison that lives in Central and South America. They're also very good sprayers, a little bit larger. And then you have things that, can't, that don't spray as well or use secretions as well, but they can, get, they can release noxious odors and fluids when they're harassed by predators. Things like civets and, 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 um, uh, um, and, and other uh, uh, bivarids and herpestids that, that can, can be, be kind of gross to handle it if they're harassed by predators. And you have a ferret badger over here, which is another, another thing that can spray quite well. So what the, the take home message of this slide is that warning coloration and noxious spray defenses have evolved independently in several carnivore groups. In fact, we, we, uh, we dove into the literature and tried to um, uh, uh, score how well these animals use their noxious, de de these animals use noxious defenses when harassed. And this, uh, this is an evolutionary tree, um, a circular tree of all the carnivores. Um, and I've sort of put the, the common names of these groups around the outside of the, of the ring where they go. I don't expect you to read the species names, but um, uh, they're, they're, the dots are color coded by how well that they use secretions. So if they don't use secretions at all, um, they're, they, they're, they're white or clear. Um, those that, that just sort of smell foul when they're harassed are in yellow. Those that can squirt them out uh, in a little stream are in orange. And those that can direct that spray like a skunk can are in red. And you can see the skunks are up here in their own little part of the tree. You have those stinky polecats I talked about over here. Um, and so, and, but, but overall, you see a lot of different carnivores can actually use their anal glands for defense. Uh, in fact, a lot of uh, anal glands initially evolved in the carnivores um, to produce um, pheromones and other so social chemical cues uh, to, use, to, to use in communication. It's just these other groups have co-opted them and evolved another, another role for them in defense. So one of our first questions that we asked was, why evolve spray defenses? If they're so useful, why do some animals have them and others don't? Well, um, who are their predators? That's the first question. So they have large carnivore predators. These, these mid-sized animals are preyed upon or could, could be preyed upon by larger carnivores. And these large carnivore mammal, these mammals are more sensitive to odors and they are more likely to be nocturnal. They're far more sensitive to odors th than we are. So, so they'd be very, very vulnerable to, to this type of spray. Predatory birds are, the, are another source of risk and things like raptors and owls. Predatory birds are actually far less sensitive to odors. They just don't smell very well. And they're more likely to be diurnal out in, in the daytime. So our, given that what we know about the, these noxious secretions, if you wanna make your defense tuned to the predator you are um, at most at risk from, then, what, then we hypothesize that species that have, that have evolved noxious weaponry should be under relatively heavier potential predation risk from carnivores, but not birds of prey. So we did a big, long analysis and came up with estimates of potential predation risk for all of these carnivore species for both birds of prey and mammalian carnivores. When we plotted these on a, on a, a figure, 
Um, here you have potential nighttime mammalian predation risk plotted against daytime avian risk. And the, the markers here are, are species. And every species, again, is color coded by that same scale of not using secretions um, to, being, to, to being very noxious and be able to spray their, their defenses um, um, in a certain direction. We've also marked on here those that, that form large social groups and those that, that are pack hunters as well. And what you can see on here is that species that are under greater risk from mammals at night, so nocturnal species that have high mammalian risk at night, are the ones that have these really noxious defenses. And those that are under really heavy risk from birds of prey in the daytime are very social. And what this means is that, that predation risk may have shaped two very important traits among the carnivores. One, mammals, mammal predation risk at night shapes the, or favors the evolution of noxious spray defenses. And being at risk of birds of prey in, in the daytime, having birds flying over, overhead and, and needing to look in all directions at once to spot uh, those predators requires a lot of eyes in the sky. That favors larger social groups and greater vigilance. So perhaps uh, avian predation risk in the daytime favored the evolution of, of large social groups among the carnivores. So we've then gone and, and we want to now narrow in on relationships between pre predators and prey, these noxious carnivores and their prey. And um, living in California, one of, the, one of the best systems to, to work in here are striped skunks and coyotes. Striped skunks are everywhere. They're, they're really easy to find. They, are, they live amongst us in urban areas. Everyone's got a great skunk story. Um, and as we know, um, uh, the coyotes have been, have been living amongst us in urban areas for quite a long time and have, have, have been, been even more and more successful of late at, at, at living amongst us in, in our, our dense urban environments. So, um, but behavior and predator-prey uh, dyads is really studied. So, so predator and warning colored prey, um, studying both animals live is, is not common. And so we asked the question, how do defended prey assess risk from different ty types of pre predators? Among the predators, are is there an innate avoidance of or individual variation in uh, how they learn about aposomatic prey by mammalian predators? So do, do, they, do predators need to, to learn to avoid these animals or do they just know from birth? And finally, what's the role of the pattern structure, contrast, and generalization in, in this learning pro process? And so we've been working for a number of years now on, on these questions in both skunks and coyotes. So striped skunks, we're gonna focus on first. Um, one of the major questions we're asking right now is how do skunks assess risk posed by mammalian and avian predators? The video you're seeing here is a live uh, actual interaction between a skunk and a coyote we caught in the field. Um, and you can see that coyote wants nothing to do with that skunk. It knows better. It knows that skunk will spray it. The skunk is on, def is on, its, on the defensive. It's got its tail straight up in the air um, and uh, it, its stripes are very apparent. It, it, it's, it's facing the coyote straight on. So you can see those bold white stripes on each side of the body. Um, and, and so the coyotes know that these animals have this strong defense and they know to avoid them. In fact, we think it's exceedingly rare for coyotes to ever attack, if not even kill a skunk. Uh, and so these skunks have a bunch of different behavioral defenses that, that they employ prior to spraying. So they, they will first run and hide if they can. Um, that they'll be confrontational, like you see here, that they might raise their tail, stomp their feet, charge. And th only then will they turn to aim and spray if the, if the animal d d does not um, uh, leave. So I tell people that if you're ever sprayed by a skunk, you've either tripped over it because you didn't see it, or you did something dumb because you didn't, you couldn't read the signs that this skunk was telling you to get out of there. So we've been asking, how do these animals assess risk from different types of predators? Are um, a, a coyote that they're well defended against, right? But a, an owl, which doesn't smell all that well, it can fly down quietly at night and attack them. They have actually very little um, defense against. And in fact, most of the mortality against skunks by natural predators is from owls. Mammalian predators rarely ever take skunks. So we, we, we were wondering how do skunks assess risk posed by mammalian and avian predators? And this is my grad student, former grad student, Kim Fisher, who went out and, and tested skunk responses to different types of audio cues of different predators. So she played back sounds of, of coyotes howling and owls hooting um, and see, to, to look at how skunks respond. I'm gonna play you a short video here of a, of a skunk responding to an owl call. Now you saw how the skunk responded to the coyote call, uh, to, to a, an actual, co co actual coyote, 
watch what happens when you just play the call of an owl. Oh, you know what? I don't know if I have my sound on here. And it's not playing. Hold on. Of course, it's not working now. I'm going to stop sharing and reshare. Sorry, guys. I think I had to hang this by now. All right. Let's see if that works. But the video is not playing. Oh, well. Well, the skunk runs away. <laughs> the tail goes down and the skunk runs away. I'm not sure why it's not playing. It was playing earlier on, um, but uh, um, it should be playing though. Oh, there we go. So that was a skunk fleeing fr from an owl call. And what she found what was that skunks were most vigilant and fled most frequently to owl sounds compared to coyote sounds. And so now we're studying this um, using visual cues from predators and we've actually built a coyote robot we've called Obi-Wan Coyote. Uh, and we're working on an owl model as well to, that will fly down and, and attack these skunks. And this, this uh, model has, has um, infrared and thermal video cameras on it that allows us to approach these skunks and get a predator's eye view of how they respond. Uh, so this is a, the, the predator's eye view, uh, and here is a video of them, uh, of a skunk uh, being more defensive, do, doing some, some very na uh, natural defensive behaviors to, to our coyote model. These are all filmed at night under zero light. All you're seeing is infrared light here, so, so um, it's totally pitch black outside to the animal, um, and, and all, uh, we're having to, to view this through, through the camera. But you can see it's doing some, some nice foot stomping, some, some um, it's pulling its tail up in the air, and it's showing off those stripes very, very well before finally running away. So my, my grad student, Hannah Rabatoy, is studying this right now, looking at how they, they respond to human uh, approaches as well as coyote approaches. We've also done a, a lot of trapping of skunks in the wild. So we spend about six seasons tra trapping skunks. We, we go out, we, we do this work up in San, D San D D Dimas, California, and we, we trap them overnight, pick them up in the morning, and um, under anesthesia, we, we can uh, mark them, take samples of them, uh, and look at, and, and in particular, we're interested in how their, their anal secretions, uh, the chemistry of them evolves. Um, so skunks, as you might know, produce their noxious secretions in their anal glands on both sides of, 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 the, of, of the anus. And your dog and cat also have these anal glands if you've taken them to the vet. Oftentimes the vet has to express those anal glands to get out all that sludge. Um, but your dog and cat have anal glands about the size of a lima bean. They're pretty small. They're probably about this big. Um, skunks have anal glands the size of a golf ball or even larger. They're, they're much, much larger. And, and um, what actually happens is they have little papilla right on the inside that can evert and come out the sphincter and fire um, the, the, those, those secretions out. This is my favorite part of the talk because I get to show you this vid video and gross everyone out. This is what it looks like when the skunk sprays up close. No, I did not take this vi video. Um, it's, it was, I can ask me later. It's, it's an amazing story how, this, how they got this shot, but I like to watch people squirm as I play this during talks. But that's what it looks like when a skunk sprays. And we can extract this solution out of, out of them while they're, while they're on the table. Um, and so Vicki Mann is a former master student in my lab and she did a study where she, um, ex she pulled uh, these the, the secretions from our California skunks here locally and also went to Texas where, um, to do a population there. The ones in California, they, they commonly see coyotes and occasionally see pumas or mountain lions. So they are under uh, heavy um, potential risk from these predators. Whereas the, the population she went to in Texas lacked both of those predators in it. So they, will, they are no longer under heavy risk from, from those mammalian pre predators and are um, uh, this so selection favoring strong defenses and bold coloration might've been relaxed at this point. And so we took these, these secretions, you can see they're sort of, they range from a golden to a, to a red co color there. And we looked at the chemistry of them. And so um, if you do gas chromatography, you, you can extract three di di different types of compounds, three here, three molecules that stink. They're all sulfur-based. So a butane thiol, a butene, uh, a butene th thiol, and a thioacetate. Um, and uh, we can measure the relative 
abundances of each of these chemicals in the secretions. And what she found was that, that secretions from the Texas population, they were on average the same level of stinkiness as the, the ones in California, but they were much more variable. And what that means is that natural selection, when, 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 so when the selection from predators declines, um, there's no longer strong selection favoring super strong, super noxious de defenses. And that means that those, those defenses can actually get more variable. They can, they can begin to diverge or drift away from the optimum. And so what you see here in this, fi this figure is that the variance in, in the Texas pop population of these chemicals is much broader than it is in, Cal in Cal California, which suggests that, that relaxed selection has, has led to more variable defenses and a weakening of their overall overall noxious spray. Incidentally, people because people always ask me, tomato juice does not work to get skunk spray out. It's a myth. It does, does not do anything to get the, the odor out of your pet. So if, you're, if your pet is ever sprayed, this is the skunk descenting recipe. One quart hydrogen peroxide, a quarter cup baking soda, and one teaspoon of di liquid dish soap. Do not put water on it. That just makes, that actually takes this thioacetate and makes it stinkier. So don't wash your dog with water. Um, if you have a dog and, and they go outside with skunks where their skunks are, just keep this stuff on hand. And um, you can't pre-mix it. You need to do it on, at the, on, on the day of because it, it, it will, um, what it does is it turns these molecules into, uh, into molecules that don't stink. So it actually um, oxidizes the, the, these molecules and, and converts them to, to things that don't actually smell. So because we found that the, the, the spray evolves and, and, and becomes more variable, we, we also looked at the stripes too. So if the spray is becoming weaker, are the stripes changing too? And so skunk stripes are actually quite variable. Around here in California, we see very consistent stripe pa patterns in our, in our skunks. But if you go to some populations all over the US, you see much more var variable stripe patterns, anywhere fr from being uh, um, almost just a small little white cap behind the head um, to being almost all white on, on the back. And so populations, in one population, you can have all uh, an all black animal and all, all white animals so side by side. In fact, even in the same litter, there can be variation in the patterns as well. But there's a single litter of fe fetal kits from Carbondale, of, um, um, Illinois. Uh, so even within a litter, there's, tr there's tremendous variation in stripe patterns. So my former grad student, Hannah, Hannah Walker, uh, looked at over 700 skunk skins and museum collections from all over the North America and plotted their locations on maps and looked at a number of different factors that might influence their, 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 um, the, the, the degree of whiteness and the degree of contrast on the animal. So she measured how much white was on their back and how much of a contrasting black and white border was on that animal as well. So here I'll just talk about predation. So we, we, we hypothesized that, there, that stronger predation risk spatially would, would select for stronger signals. So more white, more contrasting borders and also less variable signals, which means that weaker predation risk should lead to the same thing we saw with, with, the, with the chemicals, a more variable stripe pattern. And so we look, if we look at how predation risk influences both whiteness and contrast, we see that overall in the top here, this is whiteness index versus mammalian risk in, purple, in, in brown and avian risk in blue. Uh, and so the, the, um, there was no effect of, of risk on mammalian, on of avian or mammalian risk on, on whiteness, overall whiteness of the animal. However, there was, but the greater the, the mammalian and avian risks, the more extensive the contrast borders of the animal. So when risk is higher, they have a, a stronger signal overall. And what was even more interesting was when risk declines, uh, um, the, the variance is increased as well. So the, the, um, we, see, we saw much, much more variable patterns on their backs when predation risk declined, which means that relaxed selection, again, is, is relaxing the, the pressure on, on the, these animals to keep this consistent pattern. If you're trying to advertise your weaponry to a predator, you want to keep, you want to be as consistent across all the individuals as you possibly can. You, the, the more variation there is in the signal, the more likely the predator is to make a mistake. So um, what we see here is that as predation risk goes down, there's no longer that, that selection maintaining that nice standard skunk stripe on these animals. So we, we went one step further and wanted to test these ideas in actual living coyotes. And if my former grad student, Caitlin Fay, asked the question, do predators have an innate phobia of warning colors or do they have to learn to avoid them via negative experiences? 
So she went to the USDA Predator Research Facility in Millville, Utah, where they have 100 captive coyotes, uh, both, both bred there and wild caught animals, um, in a thousand square meter outdoor pens. And she first conditioned them to attack brown prey models. So she, she gave them these brown furry plates and put their food right on top and put, the, put these plates in the pens. So these animals were, were at first conditioned to eat off of these brown furry models. Totally innocuous, just get used to eating off the brown furry thing like it's a real animal. And they did it. Um, so after they'd gone through three trials of successfully eating off the brown traits, they moved on to the next round. The next round was we gave them a brown plate and a black and white skunk plate. So these are the same size plates, just with black and white, black body, white stripes on them. The difference here is that these plates have a sprayer in them, a remote, remote control sprayer. So when the the um, atta the coyote attacked these models, they got sprayed in the face with skunk oil, and they underwent. Th um, uh, and so over time, they were trained over three trials to um, on these models, and uh, um, some. The first, first time that they were sprayed in the face, never again went toward the black and white model again, only ate off the brown models. They took one, one trial learning to learn to avoid skunks. Other animals got sprayed nine times in the face and never stopped. So there was tremendous variance in how, how willing these animals were to endure being sprayed in the face to attack these models. Once they had gone through this training process and learned to, to not attack the models, she then gave them another two more trials, but this time with variant coloration. So either darker patterns or whiter patterns to see how, how the animals that the coyotes that had learned to, to um, avoid the skunks could generalize that avoidance to other patterns. Can you, if you know what a skunk looks like, can you then look, can, can you then learn to avoid something that's not quite like a skunk, but a little bit different? So here's a video of a, of hopefully, of a coyote attacking a skunk model for the very first time, and you'll hear a click in the video when, the, when, when it gets sprayed in the face. And you'll know when that is based on its behavior. There, it got sprayed in the face. And, and that animal never again attacked a skunk model in all three trials. That was enough. So if we look across the three trials, these are survival plots. The top black line is the, is the skunk model, the, the bottom brown line that you can hardly see is, the, is the, the brown model. And the faster these lines decline, it means the faster that they attack those models. What you can see is across trials one, two, and three for all these individuals, they, they were far more, the latency to attack the black and white models was far slower than it was the brown models. So they were much more reticent, even on trial one, to attack the, these black and white models, which indicates that they do have some level of innate avoidance. They were much more hesitant to go after these black and white models the first time than they were to go after the brown models the first time. So there is some innate knowledge that black and white is not something you want to go near. But it did take animals several trials oftentimes to learn to not go after them. So what happened when they went to, to generalize? Well, these animals, um, they were able to uh, uh, not able to generalize to, to, to the darker model. So the, 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 bl the black model and the narrow stripe model um, were both significantly faster attacked than, than, the, the, than the black and white model had been and, and not, not different at all from the brown model. Whereas the two whiter models were actually very, fairly well avoided. They, they did not differ from the original black and white model. So what we can say here is that, that these animals are able to generalize um, they, are, they are able to generalize when, this, when the, the signal becomes whiter or brighter, but not able to generalize when it becomes blacker or less uh, or, or weaker. So um, we're now doing one extra study. One, uh, my current student, Kathy Vo, has taken this one step fur further and she, she is now looking at how coyotes respond to stripe patterns of various contrast levels. So uh, um, black with white stripes, black with gray stripes, black with black stripes and also pattern type. So this pattern type matter, or it's just the black and white, to try to understand how do pattern and contrast um, independently uh, influence coyote avoidance. So that's the end of, my, of our skunk work. We're, we have all new stuff going on right, right, right now. I wish I could talk to you a lot more about it. I wanna end my talk tonight with two other random little tidbits here um, that you may have heard about. One, since we're talking about black and white coloration, 
Uh, we've asked the question, why are zebras striped? So um, there's lots of ideas about there on why zebras might be striped. There's actually three, uh, seven equid species, uh, three zebra species. Uh, so the mountain ze zebra, the grevy zebra, and these three down here are all different sub subspecies of the same species of the zebra. Um, the wild ass does have leg stripes. Um, but so we asked, how does how, how does woodland environments, how do uh, um, social effects, how do biting flies, how do uh, t how does t temperature all impact um, the evolution of the of these traits uh, of the of the stripes? And so what we found here was that um, biting flies are actually the strongest predictor of stripes in zebras. So what we found what was that when these biting, blood sucking, parasitic flies are are very strong and present throughout most of the year, um, we see much stronger striping in these animals. So on this tree here, these are all the subspecies of, of the zebras. Um, and the, uh, the inner circles, the black and white ones, the, the darker the circle here, the stronger the striping. And on the outer ring of, of circles, the, the, the warmer the color, the higher the level of biting fly activity. So this indicates that that these biting fly, these the zebras evolved initially striping stripes on their body to avoid being bitten by biting flies. What we think is happening here is that the that there's now new empirical evidence that the biting flies actually the stripes actually make the make the, the zebras harder for the flies to see because of their of the way that the flies' vision system works. Um, so it almost camouflages the the zebras to the flies and makes it harder for them to uh, to land on them. When you answer a question like, why do zebras have stripes, stripes you tend to get some, some attention. And, and imagine my surprise when we, we were, the, the week after this paper came out, they made a joke about it on Saturday Night Live. I just, just sort of thought I should retire right now because that's about the as high a praise as you can get. Um, so um, uh, this was a great story and um, I'm really excited to see more research coming out on how this, on, on how this biting fly zebra interaction actually works. And finally, we, we, we looked at, at why do giant pandas, why are they black and white? We did an analysis of, of how, how, how coloration on the body of carnivores in general evolves um, with different types of environmental factors. What we found is that, that coloration in pandas um, is sort of a uh, um, solving an interesting pu puzzle. Pa pandas are the only bears that eat bamboo, which is an awful thing to have to eat. And so, so they have to be active year round. They can't go into uh, torpor or hi shallow hibernation in the winter time like other bears can. And so they live in an area where it's snowy in the winter and shady forested in, in the summer. So the white on their, so, so carnivores that have lighter, whiter bodies and whiter heads tend, to, tend to, to, to live in snowier environments. Those that have darker, blacker legs tend to be to, to live in shadier forested environments. So we think the black and white coloration of pandas is, is a compromise between living in the forest and living in the snow. Um, incidentally, the other research has sh shown that their eye spots um, are used in individual recognition um, and, and the eye spots in the ears may also be involved with, with aggressive signaling amongst, amongst themselves. So, in the end, um, we've looked at some correlates of specialized anti-predator behavior, where um, how often you encounter predators, how open is your habitat, how big your body is, all of these things have positive effects on predation risk. And they have they, that then influences actual predation risk and natural selection. So the more at risk of, of predation you are, the, 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 the heavier selection is favoring these strong defenses. So this favors morphological anti-predator anti defenses. Once you evolve these, there's some other consequences of that though. You, that, that affects how you perceive risk. So, so de defended species probably don't perceive as much risk in their environment as non-defended species. They tend to evolve warning coloration to advertise those defenses to predators. There are energetic trade-offs like with brain size where you, uh, the, the stronger or the more expensive your defense is, the, the less energy you have to invest in a larger brain. And then the predators have to, have to learn about your, your defense and your signal. And, and they, they can even evolve counter adaptations to, to counter it as well. So with that, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to take your questions. I thank you for, for your attention and um, uh, would love to hear your feedback. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Dr. Sankowicz for the wonderful talk. Uh, so moving on to the questions, uh, one of our attendees asks, is the striping on the skunks in California, despite the lack of pressure from predators? So, that's that, that's that again, I missed that, what was that? 
Is the striping on the skunks in Texas still comparable to the skunks in California, despite uh, the lack of pressure from predators? Yeah, so, so actually the striping on the skunks in Texas, I didn't show, show this graph, but was actually both more variable and the stripes were shorter. So we saw the same trends uh, amongst the stripes as we did in, in, in the secretions. Um, so we have two studies that confirm the same thing. Reduced predation risk leads to more variable and weaker signals. Um, Eric asks, um, so all of these species developed an, an analogous reaction to predatory stressors. Uh, they also develop, develop similar coloration systems. Sorry, what, 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 what was the question? The, the, the question did, did they? Yeah, so uh, I, I think he's uh, verif uh, asking to verify whether or not uh, all these different species developed analogous reactions to these predatory stressors. So I, I call it, it, there's multiple ways to, to solve the same problem. They're, they're, all, they're all under the same heavy predation risk, but, but because, of, because they're, they're, the ancestors of these groups all varied in their lifestyle and, and what morphological traits they had, they, they, that, that's why they evolved to different strategies. So if you think about the, the ancestors of say armadillos, they, um, giant ground sloths, for instance, had osteoderms in their skin. They actually had the, re the, the precursors of these little bony plates in their skin. So what we think happened is that once, once they adopted these more risky environments, they just took that trait and elaborated it. It was favored to, to become more elaborate. Same thing with say um, porcupines. So um, the, those were, the porcupines are amongst, amongst the, the groups of larger rodents. They already have longer, thicker hair, uh, more coarse hair, like, like a capybara for, for instance. And um, uh, if you have longer, coarser hair, why not just co-op co that into, 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 into something rather than evolving armor? Um, so they're, they're solving the same problem just in different ways. Um, and it's just um, a, by random chance how they, how they achieve these, these morphologies. Um, in a similar question, uh, Eric also asks why their, color, uh, their coloration uh, systems are very similar to each other. Is it just due to chance or because black and white has the best contrast? Uh, it's because black and white has the best contrast. That's a, that's a great question. So amongst all of these species, their, their, their main predators are going to be birds and mammals. So um, if mammals are a key predator and you're trying to encourage mammals to not attack you, black and white, so most mammalian carnivores are dichromatic, meaning they, they only see in two colors. And so black and white is the most contrasting set of, of colors that you can pick to advertise your, your defense. That, that's why most defended mammals are black and white. Whereas if you think about insects and frogs that are trying to advertise their defenses, they're very colorful. You see reds and oranges and, and, and yellows uh, along with black and white. And that's because birds see in color. So if their main predator is, has color vision, then you want to add more bright co colors to, to make your, your signal more obvious as well. So um, most, most of, these, of these mammalian prey have evolved the same black and white strategy because most of, their, of, most of the time they're trying to encourage ma mammal predators to not attack them and mammals just see them black and white. There are very few, there's only a couple of prey species. Um, there's one ten, there's two tenrec species that, that are, are, ye are yellow and black. And a few, a few of the porcupine species, um, the, their quills can be yellowish in tint and not truly white. So there are some yellow uh, and black animals. Um, uh, and there may be some heavier bird predation in those species. But, uh, for, but for the most part, it's, it's all black and white. Thank you. Um, one of uh, the attendees also asks what the human impact on scuff skunk defenses are and whether or not um, the skunks have evolved any other defensive mechanisms towards us humans. Um, skunk defensive, skunks, I, I can't say skunks have evolved to humans. Um, well, one thing I didn't sh show you in that study of skunk stripe evolution was that we, we looked at how they varied in, in terms of urban areas. So skunk skins from, from urban areas uh, or high areas of high population density as opposed to, to, to low density. Um, there was really no effect of urbanization, uh, maybe just very, very weak effect on signal strength, but re really not much at all. So I can't say that skunks have really evolved in response to humans. Skunks, um, they, th their response to, to predators is to defend themselves. So, so in humans, 
for the most part, know not to go near skunks, right? So if you see a skunk, most people are gonna run away or back away and not go near it. Your dog, on the other hand, is not so bright. So dogs have been bred to, to, be, to get so much reward from attacking little furry animals that, they, that, that any negative effects of attacking has, is, is, is gonna be overridden by um, the, the pleasure and joy that they get from attacking them. Same thing with porcupines too. So um, skunks, ha ha they're, they're trying to cope in a, in a human dominated world now. They do very well in, in human ur in urbanized areas because there's lots of food and lots of water around and humans tend to stay away from them. Their biggest issues are dogs um, and cars. Cars, of course, are the, are the biggest issue. Um, so there, there's no real defenses towards humans or no real evolutionary response that, that I know of to, to, to humans, but they're just trying to cope with not getting run over. Uh, Na Naima asks, what do we know about the evolution of anti-predator to human predators? Uh, the evolution of anti-predator behavior in animals to human predators. Um, that I don't, I don't think I have a, a, a strong answer for you because in order to test that, you, you, you need to look at, at, at prey that lack human predators and those that have them. There are some studies that have looked at island prey, so, so species that live on islands that have never seen humans before, and they actually are far tamer than those that, that are exposed to humans. So if you did an, a human approaches towards island animals, you tend to get, you can, you can get much closer to them because they're not as afraid of humans. So I don't know of any uh, obvious morphological anti-predator adaptations to, to human um, uh, uh, Pre 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 predators that come to mind. Um, there probably are such some out there if we look back in the fossil record, but um, usually it's a, it's a behavioral response. Usually an animals become, um, uh, when they first encounter humans, become far more wary of them and afraid of them. Over time, some animals have learned to habituate to humans, like those that live in urban areas and parks on a university campus, the squirrels, for instance, they learn that humans aren't gonna hurt them. So um, it really depends on the context in which that they live, and, and, but, but usually the, their anti-predator response is gonna, gonna be more behavioral and less morphological. Uh, Julie asks, what kind of things cause skunks to go into backyards and what sort of things can we do to prevent them from coming in? Are they looking for food? Can you, can you tell my dog got sprayed? <laughs> All right, that's a great question, actually. So, I actually, on my web page, I have a whole page on there about how to, um, I guess, skunk-proof your yard, how to get rid of skunks in your yard, uh, how to discourage them. Skunks love to eat fruit that's fallen on the ground. That they love to eat insects in the ground, little worms and grubs and insects, um, and they like piles of things in dark little dens to, to den down in. So, if you don't want skunks in your yard, uh, make sure there's no fruit on the ground. Don't leave pet food out. Don't leave garbage out. Um, don't leave piles of vegetation or big dense thickets of bushes that they can make a den in. Um, and uh, you can't get rid of the worms in your grass, I guess, unless you po poison your lawn, which I don't think, think you'd want to do. But you taking those major steps of just making sure there's no fruit on the ground, no trash, no pet food, um, uh, closing off all the entrances to under your house, um, those are all the best strategies for, for making sure skunks are discouraged from, from coming into your yard. But all, in the end, it's going to be hard to skunk proof everything in, unless you have a fence fenced in down to the ground where they can't go, go underneath. Um, there's no real way to totally prevent skunks from entering your yard. Our next question asks whether or not the, the skunk toxin only stinks when it is excreted by the skunk or whether it still stinks if when it's removed uh, manually? I can, I can firmly attest to the fact that it still stinks when you pull it out, um, when you extract it in, in a syringe. Um, it's not as bad because it's in a syringe and it's just like a drop, a dro dro droplet on the tip of the syringe when you put it in the vial um, because it hasn't been aerosolized. It hasn't been bursting through the air. It's not floating around out there. That's when it gets really bad. Um, so, but it, I mean, it still stinks, but it goes away real quick. What once it's in the vial, you clean it up, you put some bleach on it, it's fine. Um, it goes away, but um, the the uh, it, it really becomes worse when when it gets into the air and it's flo floating around. It's not it's not all about um, it, it. It still stinks, but but it, to be truly horrific, it has to be floating around in the air. 
Uh, awesome. And I think we're approaching, this is our last question of the night. Uh, it's just a fun question asked by Gloria. Where can one buy an owl sound maker? An owl sound maker? Um, oh, well, you know, I don't know. There's pro you can buy owl, I know you can buy owl decoy models. So we, we actually have a few in my lab that, that you can set on your fence post and, and their visual models. Um, I don't, I'm sure sharper image maybe, I don't know, uh, can play a sound maker. You can hook up a computer to play a speaker with sounds. I, I don't know of one off the shelf that you can buy though. Awesome. Um, well, thank you again for this wonderful talk and your time today, Dr. Stankowicz. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. All right, thank you all. Um, we will have this up on the web later if you want to watch a recording of it. And we hope everyone has a great night. Thank you. Uh, how, how, how did, oh.